Joining me now is the Shadow Minister for the Housing and the NDIS, Michael Suka. Michael Suka, thanks for your time this morning. Let's start with the Tasmanian election result Andrew. overnight. A, su a surprise twist with Labor trying to seize power with the Greens, even though it won less seats than the Liberals. What's your reaction? Well, I think to some political observers, Andrew, it's the least surprising news ever that there seems to be an appetite within the Labor Party to govern in coalition with the Greens. We obviously saw the Greens uh, in the lead up to Election Day saying there's no circumstance where they would support the Liberal Party. Uh, we had the Labor leader last night refusing to concede defeat. You can only draw one conclusion, and that is uh, the Labor Party has in mind a coalition with the Greens. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if those discussions were occurring prior to the election, to be quite frank. But what we did see, Andrew, is the Liberal Party uh, win the highest share of the vote, win the highest number of seats. I'm sure they will be invited by the Governor uh, to test the numbers on the floor of the Parliament, invited to form a government. Uh, no doubt there'll be a lot of horse trading between now and then, but as the highest vote getter, highest number of seats, you'd expect that uh, Jeremy Rockliffe and the Liberal Party will be invited to form that government, notwithstanding the Labor Party seemingly uh, having a a bob each way with the Greens to have a formal uh, arrangement with them. Mm. Well, it comes after some encouraging results in Queensland a week ago for the LNP. Having said that, there was a disappointing result in South Australia for the Liberal Party in Dunstan. After the disappointment of Dunkley, do some of these results give you encouragement leading into a federal election next year? Well, Andrew, they're all, uh, they're all different and they all have their own context. I think... Uh, anyone that's watched the opposition over the last couple of years have seen that we're very focused, uh, that we're principled, that under Peter Dutton's leadership uh, we stand for the things that will make Australians' life easier. Uh, but the truth is, Andrew, politics is an arm wrestle. There's no silver bullet. There's no knockout blow. Uh, you've got to get up every single day and convince the Australian people as to why your vision for the country is better. I, I must say... Uh, it's relatively easier when you have a Prime Minister like Anthony Albanese who uh, breaks promises at will, just constantly break prom breaks promises, and you alluded to another potential broken promise, and also a Prime Minister who's, who's so disconnected from uh, what is happening with household budgets, the pressure that families are feeling with cost of living, the pressure they're feeling paying their mortgages, the pressure paying their energy bills, even though the Prime Minister promised them uh, energy relief of $275 a year. Uh, so um, Australians are hurting. We've got a Prime Minister who thinks they've never had a better, uh, and our job will be to side with Australians, fight for them. And I think if we do so, Andrew, uh, we'll be very competitive at the next election. I wanted to ask about the government's proposed religious freedom changes. What do you make of the Prime Minister's approach on this? <laughs> it's extraordinary. I mean, he went to the election making this promise. He's now saying he won't proceed with bipartisan support. Well, uh, uh, that's quite an extraordinary statement. And the consultation that the government's undertaken on this has required religious leaders, religious organisations to sign non-disclosure agreements. When the coalition went through this very laborious process of consultation, it was all done publicly. Uh, all draft bills, exposure drafts were released publicly for people to digest and disseminate uh, in a number of different forums. This has been cloaked in secrecy uh, and we uh, see uh, an open letter from a range of uh, leaders, uh, Christian, Muslim, uh, Orthodox, uh, a number of religious uh, organisations who have uh, educational uh, facilities uh, expressing their deep concern with what the government's proposed. Uh, so you've got uh, the alarm bell being rung by the organisations who run religious schools, who educate millions of Australian children. Uh, if they haven't been brought to the table, if they haven't been convinced of these changes, how on earth does Anthony Albanese think he's going to get bipartisanship? All right. There's been a report this morning that Building Skills Australia is warning there's not enough tradies to meet the government's housing target. What did you make of that? Well, it's just another example of how the Labor Party's fake target can never be met. We saw data just a couple of weeks ago reported in The Australian that showed that their 1.2 million home target they would miss 
from by anywhere from two to four hundred thousand. I mean, we're not talking about missing it by a small margin. We're talking about their their promise being um, broken by hundreds of thousands of homes. We've seen new homes at their lowest levels for over ten years. We've seen new home buyers at their lowest levels since the global financial crisis. We see rents up by twenty six percent. We see surging and record migration, and yet. Uh, on the skills lists, the sorts of skills that are involved in the construction of homes have not been dialed up. We've seen students dialed up. Obviously, we saw 548,000 um, migrants to the end of the September quarter, uh, absolute record levels of migration, yet the government's uh, not using those places to bring in the, the people with the skills to build homes. Uh, they're bringing in predominantly students. So we've got a migration program that's not helping build homes. All we've got is a migration program that's putting more pressure on the market. We've now got vacancy rates at a national level sitting at 1%, and in many markets it's below 1%. As I said, rents up by 26%. A government that has absolutely opened the floodgates to migration with no idea of where those people would live. And that's why we see right, uh, Labor's housing crisis where it is right now. On the government's help to buy legislation, then why is the opposition so opposed to it? Because in some ways it could be compared to your use super for housing first home buyers policy. People argue it might drive up prices, but at least it helps first home buyers in the market. Well, Andrew, to be frank, their so-called help to buy scheme is so tiny and insignificant, it's barely worth talking about. But the truth is, we've got shared equity programs throughout the country. If you want to co-own a home with the government, which, let's be frank, very few Australians want, but if you do want to do that, there are state governments who offer you shared equity places. In New South Wales, for example, 94% of the shared equity places are still available. They're unused. Only 6% of them have been taken up because people don't want to co-own a home with the government. And this Help to Buy scheme, which is now already more than 12 months late, it was supposed to start on the 1st of January last year, uh, has so many unanswered questions. Uh, if your income goes above the required levels, will you be forced to sell your home? Who covers the repairs and maintenance on the house? If the government owns 40% of your home and you need to spend thousands of dollars fixing the roof, uh, why would it be the, co the homeowner's responsibility to fix that roof without a contribution from the government? Because let's remember, under the, that scheme, the government gets a whack that 40% back at the end. Mm. So there are so many reasons why Australians don't really use shared equity schemes. There'll be a very small number that do, and anyone that wants to use a shared equity scheme can do so now because they're already available. And it's a shame that two years into this government, the only thing they could come up with was a half-baked plan that just replicates what happens in the States and they haven't delivered any other home ownership policy in two years in the midst of a housing right. crisis. It's quite remarkable. All right, all right. All right, just finally, nearly out of time. There was a Liberal pre-selection for Kuyong last night. Amelia Hamer was pre-selected. Can we assume this is the end of any speculation Josh Frydenberg will run again? Well, look, Josh has, has made his position clear, uh, but we, uh, we know our, Josh was supporting and we'll support a number of candidates, including Amelia Hamer in Kuyong. We'll all get behind Amelia. She's an outstanding individual. And let's be frank, from uh, I'm a bit biased, but I think we have pre-selected a number of outstanding candidates, particularly here in Victoria with the Liberal Party, whether it's Amelia, whether it's uh, Manny Cicciello in Aston, whether it's Theo Zagrafis in Chisholm, whether it's, uh, uh, it's our candidate in Monash, Mary Aldred, We've got a number of outstanding candidates and Amelia is just another one who's going to fly the flag and work really hard for her community, a community she's grown up in, that she's passionate about and that uh, I'm very hopeful will represent in our parliament. Michael Suka, thanks so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Andrew.